Well, good morning. So, actually, Jimmy McKee was going to speak today on the goodness of the Lord. And he got sick, which is very awful. And so, Anthony, boy, that sounds really loud and echoey. Um, Anthony was going to fill in, and he was going to talk about mercy. And so, um, because that's what he shared last night at Vine. And so, 9.30 last night, uh, I get this call. Hey, Kathy. (laughs) Yeah? I can't talk. (laughs) I'm like, okay. And he said, could you teach tomorrow? (laughs) Oh, um, less than 12 hours away. Uh, Can I have 10 minutes? (laughs) And so he said, sure. And so I went to my husband and said, huh. What should I do? <laughs> Actually, Anthony said, do you have anything burning to say? And I thought, I, right now I'm just ready to go to bed. So <laughs> I, had, I had been working outside in my garden, so I wasn't really uh, in, on that train. So anyway, um, so I called him back and said, how about you give me your notes? <laughs> so I have something to start with. And he sent me a PowerPoint. And so um, today I'm going to talk about mercy. And I know you were expecting goodness, but they, they go together because they're both attributes of God. Okay, so what we're doing this year is we're talking about the inward, the upward, and the outward journeys. And so we split the year into thirds. And the first third, we talked about the inward journey. And you guys heard a lot about um, healing restoration and forgiveness and all those kinds of things. And then um, the second section, we're going to be talking about the upward journey. And we're going to learn about the Lord. And um, the inward journey is really about your identity. But the upward journey is about beholding and becoming. It's about beholding who God is and becoming like him. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so what, um, and Paul wrote this, and it's really encouraging because I think about the fact that as we get to know the Lord, we get to become more like him. And so this is a really important, um, all of them are, the inward, the upward, and the outward journey are all very important journeys, but um, I'm excited about this one. So May through June, we are going to be talking about the attributes of God. And um, simply put, um, God's attributes answer the question, what is God like? And, um, (laughs) okay, I'm only going to use this joke once. But, uh, so, I'm going to share with you what Anthony thinks (laughs) his attributes are like. So here we go. He's He's quoting Tozer. And an attribute of God is whatever God has in any way revealed as, a being, as being true of himself. It is also something we can conceive as being true of him. God, being infinite, must possess attributes of which we can know nothing. Wow. So the attributes of God, um, you know, sometimes you think you know something. And I think the older I get, the more I realize there's more I don't know. And they say that's wisdom when you know that you don't know. And um, so, you know, you think you know God, and then he goes even deeper and even wider and even bigger. And and so the thing, we were going to try and, like, scratch the surface of what is God like. And um, as I was sharing first service, I started thinking about attributes. And, yes, we can have... The attributes that we're going to talk about today, we might have them, but um, God's attributes, they don't change. Like if you say, you know, if I say, um, you know, know, someone has blue eyes, they don't change their eyes. I mean, unless you get colored contacts, but that's not what I'm talking about. So your eyes are the color they are, right? That is an attribute that does not change. Okay, it does not change. Just because your mood changes doesn't mean your eyes change. You know, you're, you, that is who you are. And so the attributes of God are like that. They do not change, okay? And so today, I'm going to talk about God's mercy. And um, Tozer writes that God's mercy is an infinite and inexhaustible energy 
within the divine nature which disposes God to be actively compassionate. So it doesn't change. It goes, it stays the same, just like eye color, it stays the same. It doesn't end. It, it just goes on forever. And it's actively compassionate. It keeps being compassionate. Active, not passive. It is something that keeps on going. His compassion keeps on going. And um, Erickson says God's loving compassion for his people, his tenderness of heart towards the needy. That's what God's mercy is. It's, he's tender towards those who need him. And, um, and there's another scholar in, that writes in the Old Testament that says it expresses the love of a parent for a child. And when I read this last night or this morning, um, I was reading about, you know, we think about, like sometimes we think about mercy, um, and we think it's like letting somebody off. But it's not that trite. It's not that, you know, whatever. It, it's, it's deeper than that. It is, it is out of love for him, or us, that his mercy um, get, you know, he shows compassion towards us and that he shows mercy towards us. And um, when, I, when I was reading this, I, what the, well, the thing that came to my mind was Isaiah 49, 15. And the New Living Translation says, never, exclamation point, never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would never forget you. That's what God says. He will never forget you. Never. His word. So, so even if you, you know, sometimes we, we struggle with a parent, you know, picture, maybe somebody does. Um, maybe you don't. If you have a good parent, you know, and you've had somebody that is a good model, then you can think God is exponential to what your parent is like. And if you had a bad parent, it says God's love for you never fails. Um, the word mercy, the word mercy, um, <laughs> um, it, it comes up for the very first time. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure about the for very first time, but one of the times that it comes up is when, um, okay, so let's back up. Moses, Moses gets to lead, gets to lead a rebellious people not by his own choosing, okay? So he gets told, this is what you're going to do. And he gets to lead them without a plan. He doesn't know where they're going or what they're going to do next. And they're going out and they leave Egypt and they go out into the wilderness and they're kind of wandering around and the people are grumbling and things are going on. And, and Moses is frustrated and it's like, okay, look, God, you stuck me with these people and I don't know the plan, so you got to give me some encouragement here. you got to give me something. At least show me something about you. And God sa says to him, okay, I'll let you, you know, see a bit of my glory. Can't look right on me because that would destroy you. So um, he, in Exodus 34, 6, it says, And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And what I want you to pick out here is that he did two things. God said to Moses, his name, no one had known his name before. God revealed his name. I am who I am, which is Yahweh. And then he said, this is who I am. He said, this is my attribute. I am compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. The very first thing he speaks of is his mercy. It's the very first thing he says. You know, it's like, this is what I want you to know about me. It's so important. I'm going to tell you my name and who I am. I am mercy. And that just, that just is amazing to me. If you think about all the gods that were, you know, that they were um, worshiping at that time, that, you know, that 
they weren't very merciful, like children's sacrifice and all the craziness that they had to do. And here comes God who says, I am merciful. <clears throat> oh, yes, and compassionate. Um, this Hebrew word is used 13 times and is often translated merciful, is derived from a word meaning to love slash have mercy. Same thing. Love mercy, love mercy. And is, in, is the attribute God chooses to lead when he describes his own character. That's pretty amazing. You know, I've, I've heard um, before, I, I, you know, I've heard the uh, little saying, and, I, and I'll forget it now, but it's like the difference between grace and mercy, and it's like, oh, there's a little saying, and I always forget. And so as I was um, preparing somewhere in the middle of the night, I was thinking about um, grace and mercy, and I was reading this um, you know, exhortation or whatever, um, commentary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, bless you. You're having mercy on me. Thank you so much. Um, I was reading this commentary, and, and they said, you know, com um, grace is kind of like, you know, and I've often thought this, it's like when you get a birthday gift I, for your birthday, like you didn't do anything. I mean, and I've often said, I think mothers should get the birthday gift on the day of the birthday. I mean, really, the baby did nothing, okay? They did nothing. But we give gifts. I mean, it, it, the, the grace is like that. Grace is a gift that is given. But mercy is that um, compassion. It's the thing that drives. It's the, it's the love that you receive. It's that, it's that heart that goes, oh, I just want to do this. And that's that's what mercy is. Um, so the word mercy in Psalm 103, 13 says, um, the, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Okay, I'm sorry, back up. This is, this is three different translations for the same scripture. Okay, so one translation says that the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. And then the next translation, the New King James Version, is as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. And the third translation, Graham, help me out, because I don't know what the NCV is. Contemporary version. Contemporary version, thank you. The Lord has mercy on those who respect him as a father has mercy on his children. So that same root word can mean compassion, tenderness, um, pity, and mercy. All right? So, that, so those, are, those are all the ways that it is, it is described. And the reason is because the word mercy has a depth of meaning that's difficult to translate as one thing. It can't just be one thing. It's this... It's this hard to describe or encapsulate. And so we're, we're, so I'm trying to describe something that's indescribable. Great. Yeah. So anyway, um, it attempts to convey, but what it does do, and this is um, this author uh, lexicon, says it attempts to convey the soothing, cherishing, gentle love that a parent has for a child. And the Hebrew word for for womb is derived from this word. And the reason that it's that way is because if you think of a child being fragile in the womb, it, the womb itself is cherishing that fragile being. It is taking care of. It's having mercy for. It's compassionate for. And it's attending to that child. And that's God's mercy for us. It's his mercy for you and for me to wrap you in and hold you close. And that's what, and when you need it, it truly is our only hope. When we think about sometimes the things that we've done or the things that, you know, sometimes all we can do is ask for mercy. And God is always merciful. Always. Um, 
I, I also looked up some other places in the Old Testament um, that it talks about his mercy. And one was in 2 Samuel 24, 14. It says, David said to God, I am in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into the human hands. So it's like, you know what? I got a better shot with God than I got with anybody else. Because his mercies oh, are so good. It also says in, in Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all who he has made. So who in here was not made by God? <laughs> then his compassion is for you. His mercy is for you. His tenderness is for you. Um, God's mercy. So um, we, we, you know, we read about this, that it is an infinite, inexhaustible energy. It is um, God's loving compassion for his people and his tenderness, and it expresses the love of a parent to a child. You know, um, <laughs> Anthony's not here, and I, uh, I used his notes, but I have changed them to, to, so that I could share. And um, I... <laughs> so that was what the Old Testament had to say. So now we're going to talk about the New Testament. And one of the things that I heard Anthony say not too, not too long ago was that he, he doesn't like how um, Jesus is depicted in all the pictures because it shows him as like this weak, you know, not, not very strong, you know, kind of a wimp. And, um, <laughs> but I, as I was looking for things, I thought, you know, I think the reason that people dis some, some of the reason that the artwork showed this was because they show that compassion, that tenderness, that mercy on, you know, Jesus, that, that look of, the, of Jesus towards people is that. It's that mercy and that love, you know? And so if you're reading the stories about Jesus, what comes out is his mercy. What comes out is his love. So um, in Mark 6, it says, when Jesus landed from a boat, because <laughs> when I first read that, I was like, he landed? Oh, yeah, landed, a boat. That would be, it's like, I just thought it was a funny way to describe it. But, you know, I guess, I guess they would have landed. I mean, they landed on land, right? I mean, it didn't necessarily have a dock all the times. Huh? I am, uh, I think landed, you know, not, yeah, okay. All right, landed. Okay, so, sorry, sorry, just, yeah. So Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them, that's what mercy means, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And so he taught them out of his compassion. And in Matthew 9, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, um, this, this I just realized this morning um, as I was sharing first service that, you know, if you think about it, and it took me a long time to know this, and maybe, maybe you guys all know this, and that's fine, but after... Um, God spoke to the prophets and, and you know, kind of the, um, the Old Testament ends. The Jewish people came up with 613 new laws. And, um, and one, of the, one of the commentaries says they, they had added 613 laws that produced a heartless, cold, arrogant brand of righteousness. And the outcomes were that People were accountable to man instead of God. That there was a judgmental spirit. That there was inconsistencies between the laws and what God said. It was burdensome and it was strictly external. So in walks Jesus and he goes, oh man, oh man. 
you guys are judgmental, you're burdened, you're heavy. And so what does he do? He has compassion and says, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you what God really says. I'm going to teach you what, what love is really like because of his compassion. <clears throat> and that's what he did. He, he taught them out of his compassion for them and knowing they had been saddled with things that, that was not what God intended. Um, you know, the, then there's several stories in the New Testament that sh display uh, the, God's compassion and, and mercy. And the <clears throat> first one I'm going to talk about is in Matthew 15. And it's the story of Jesus feeding the, the um, people. And so he, um, it says that Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. Then he took seven loaves and the fish, and when he gave thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. You know, Jesus wasn't just concerned about their hearts. He was concerned about their physical being, too. He had compassion on them, and he fed them. He knows that we have needs, and he's faithful to give us what we need. In Matthew 18, uh, I think this is interesting. Um, I just shared this with you guys a couple weeks ago. Um, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop. So Jesus used this parable because he's trying to get the people to understand. Yeah, I know that you understand God to be this judgmental this harsh, I, I know what you're, you're feeling. The burden of those 613 laws, the things that have been added to you, I understand where your heart is. I'm going to tell you what it's really like. Yeah. And this is what it's really like. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, the man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Jesus is making a point. This is what God's mercy is like. This is who God is. You guys have a misconception of, of God. This is who he is. He's merciful. <clears throat> and then another story. Um, in Luke 7, 12 through 15, as Jesus approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And what that meant at that time was, you know, you had to... You're, if you didn't have a husband, your son provided for you. So now she's lost everything, and there's no way for her to get provision. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Same word for mercy. And he said, don't cry. And then he went up and did something he's not supposed to do. He went up and touched a dead body against the law, against God's law. He went up and touched the briar they were carrying him on, and the bears stood still. But Jesus is the author of life. And when he went up and touched that body, he spoke to the dead man and, be and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. So the dead man sat up and began to talk. He's the author of life. His mercy brought that man back to life. And another story, <laughs> prodigal. The prodigal son, and I know you guys have heard this a lot, but it, it, I, didn't, I didn't know. I've heard it so many times, and I didn't realize that the word prodigal actually means wasteful and reckless. Wasteful and reckless. So here's the prodigal son, and he's gone and spent his inheritance. He's been places where he shouldn't have been, doing things he shouldn't have done. He loses everything. He ends up in a pigsty. I'm sure was filthy, 
wearing, it didn't smell good, didn't look good. And he decides he's going to go to the father and ask to be a servant. And in Luke 15, 20, it says, And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to see him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. <sighs> Sorry, my son had been sleeping with the pigs. I'm not sure I would have thrown my arms around him and kissed him until he had a shower. But the father doesn't do that. The father says, you know what? I don't care how dirty you are. I want to love on you. I don't care what you've done. I want to show you mercy. I want to show you compassion. I want to love on you. And not only did he kiss him, but then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they celebrated. You know, God is bigger than your mistakes. Amen. He cleans you up. He takes that dead nature and gets rid of it and fills you with new life. Because of his mercy. Because of his mercy. In John 10, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. And in John 15, it says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. You know what? Jesus counts you as a friend. He laid his life down for you. He is full of mercy and compassion. If you didn't know that when you walked in, <clears throat> I want you to know it when you walk out. God loves you. He gave up his life for you so that you could be clean, so that you could be set free. In Lamentations 3.22, it says, Because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. Tozer writes this. <clears throat> Sorry. God's mercy is an infinite, inexhaustible energy within the divine nature which disposes God to be actively compassionate. If we could remember that the divine mercy is not a temporary mood, but an attribute of God's eternal being, we would no longer fear that it would someday cease to be. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't have a bad day. He doesn't get into a bad mood. He doesn't wake up on the wrong side of the bed. His mercy is always for us. Nothing that has occurred or will occur, nothing that has occurred or will occur in heaven or earth or hell can change the tender mercies of our God. Nothing you can do changes his mind. Nothing. Nothing you've done, nothing the enemy does, nothing Satan tries to do changes his mind about you. Forever his mercy stands, a boundless, overwhelming, immensity of divine pity and compassion. That is the attribute of mercy. So, where do you need mercy? Do you have a practical need? Do you need knowledge? Do you need food? Do you, are you having money trouble? Do you need God's mercy? You just go and ask. That's all you have to do is ask God. 
You know, you just say, God, this is where I'm at. I need to know more about you. I need to be filled with your compassion. I need food, whatever it is. Or do you have a spiritual need? Do you need forgiveness? Do you need joy? Or do you just need a hug? You know, we, uh, we talk a lot about um, healing restoration because it is powerful. And I've shared with you on many occasions about you know, seeing somebody that rightfully hurt me and I, I have to forgive them anyway. But what comes is I ask God, you know, God, how do you see that person? You know, every time God shows me his picture of someone, it's a merciful picture. It shows his love for that person. And when I see that per another person through God's eyes, then his mercy wells up in me. And I can extend mercy where I haven't been able to before. It is a powerful thing. Maybe you need mercy from the cross today. Maybe that's what you need. He's waiting for you to come and say, I need your mercy. I need compassion. I'm hurting. I'm in trouble. Whatever it is, God is there because he loves you. And that compassion and that tenderness of a father towards his son, daughter, doesn't change. So would you close your eyes today? I just want to pray. Father, we just thank you. Thank you that you are merciful. That you love us. That you have compassion for us, even in our situations. Maybe a situation that we caused ourselves by doing or not doing something. God's mercy is right there. He loves you. And he wants to take you in his arms and clean you up. Forgive you, provide for you. Take care of your needs. It's who he is. Father, I just ask right now that you would just reveal this to us all this week, that we would be reminded of your mercy and your love for us. We just thank you today, Lord. Just thank you that you never change.